So we condemn the language that Donald Trump has used to marginalize, to demonize, and to divide Americans uh, against Americans and American communities. Today, we stand here today to reaffirm that, uh, that this important aspect of our community, which is American community, his comments, his rhetoric in this election has unleashed uh, a segment of our population that rely on fear and divide and even get into uh, acting against uh, those minority communities, including the Muslim community. We understand that Donald Trump has, among his staff and among his advisors, known Islamophobes who have also articulated some of the messaging uh, that we believe, including General Flynn, who has been quoted to say that Islam is cancer. And we believe that this type of as association with individuals like that drive behind a lot of the rhetoric that Donald Trump has made against the Muslim community, uh, specifically the Somali American community, and many of the other minority communities in the United States. All of this rhetoric is creating an unsafe environment for the Muslim community, for the Somali American community. And we have seen an increase and rise in Islamophobia, anti-Muslim, uh, efforts across the state of Minnesota here, but across the United States. Just in the past few weeks, a number of incidents have occurred across the United States where Muslim individuals have been killed as what appears to be hate crime. Here in Minnesota, just a few weeks ago, we have seen uh, an incident involving five young Muslim men who were shot up by a man. Uh, we believe that incident is a hate crime. While we don't know exactly the full motives, we believe this is part of the climate that is being created by the rhetoric that Donald Trump and his campaign has created to a certain extent. The Somali American community is an American community. It is part of the growing immigrant community here in the United States. They are a proud community. They are your teachers, your uh, police officers, your TSA officials. They are your business owners, small business owners. They are your average Americans in this community. They are today uh, your even Olympians, as Hassan Mead, who is a member of this community, is representing the United States in the Olympics as we speak today. Somali Americans are reviving small towns across the state of Minnesota in Maine and many parts of the United States. And they are even reviving forgotten neighborhoods in urban, city, in urban areas, including here in Minneapolis, reviving uh, with their effort to make America better. And therefore, the rhetoric that, has, uh, that Donald Trump has viewed specifically against the Somali American community really uh, is a continuation of the anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant uh, uh, rhetoric. And this rhetoric definitely uh, is falling to many of our young people who today are, uh, have a bright future in becoming part of this country and specifically also being civically engaged as we have today not only a city council member uh, in the city of Minneapolis, but we also have uh, possibly the first uh, female uh, state elective uh, representative in Ilhan Omar. This divisive rhetoric must come to an end. We have been alerted that Donald Trump has made an ambiguous apology, and we are asking for clarification to know that those individuals that he continues to divide, hurt, and incite those individuals who even want to uh, act against Muslims. Uh, this past week, uh, or a week ago, the Somali Museum, which is one of the most uh, important uh, aspect, or important uh, uh, architectural or important cultural uh, entity in our state here, was sent uh, a, a Trump supporter, left them a very hateful message, and in that message, the Trump report. The Trump supporter said that uh, the that after uh, Donald Trump becomes the president, that he will um, uh, that the Somali Museum and all of the Somalis should prepare and pack and go home because Donald Trump will force all Somali Americans out. This is the type of rhetoric coming from the campaign that incites individuals in our community to think like that 
and not only just to think about it, but then to make the action to call the Somali Museum and to say that because Donald Trump will become a president, you will no longer exist in our society. This rhetoric is dangerous, and we ask for clarification today as Donald Trump makes a visit to the state of Minnesota. And today we also ask other GOP leaders in our state to stand with the minority community, to stand with the Somali American community, and to stand with other immigrant communities that have come under uh, attack from this rhetoric from the campaign that Donald Trump has, uh, has done. If the apology that Donald Trump uh, has issued is honest, then we need that apology to be uh, toward those who have been affected by the rhetoric that came from his campaign. With that, I'll end my part of the statement, and I will uh, now uh, hand it over to one of our young uh, activists who have been moved and wanted to be here today to share his frustration, to share his voice on this issue specifically uh, with this campaign and to this candidate. Some community specifically, he has set back the work that they have done to get rid of misconceptions about Islam. Um, not only you know as the time Islam has came forth, but since 9-11 where a lot of Muslim leaders have been trying to take back um, what is ours in the faith and, and really show that this is an inclusive uh, community in the United States rather than showing that discord that Trump has done. Uh, Minnesota, as it stated itself, is inclusive and diverse uh, with the Somali community, as, as uh, Mr. Hussein has said, our business leaders. Uh, we're also students and teachers um, and also soon to be elected officials as well. And I think that Donald Trump can learn a lot from people like Ilhan Omar and their coalition building and, and their leadership skills in that regard. Um, but uh, sowing this divisive rhetoric uh, brings discord to neighbors and nations. Um, so when, when Donald Trump equates the refugees who are fleeing from the persecutions that they are in Syria, he's equating the victims with the victimizers and the people who are being persecuted by those who are persecuting them, uh, which I think is um, unjust. And I, and I call right now for Donald Trump for himself to disavow himself and unequivocally uh, renounce what he has said um, wholeheartedly. And uh, your words are bringing insult to injury for these people. Um, and if you are so supposedly running to be the President of the United States, I hope that you look back at one of our founding fathers, my favorite founding father, who is Thomas Jefferson, who wrote about Islam and he said that the religious freedom in this country, which was the founding of this country, um, was also inclusive for Muslims, um, who he saw that they you know, taught in our religion um, to be inclusive and to uh, be tolerant and also uh, you know, have those kind of discussions with people across faiths. Uh, so when you reach across the aisle um, after November, if you are to be elected, please reach across denominations or across faiths and really build that coalition to make, supposedly make America great again. But if, if you want to, sir, I'd say first start with yourself and, and, and bring a, a more inclusive message. So uh, thank you for your time. Um, working with uh, so many youth in the community and seeing that how many immigrants have uh, very positively contributed to the society, it needs to be seen that this trend will continue uh, for a long time, God willing, as it goes. Immigrants will come and they will always positively uh, contribute. So to set a good example for our youth and children now, at the, even the, at the age of 10, 11, and 12, they understand these things much more than we anticipate, uh, we perceive. And so they see this kind of threat uh, or this kind of rhetoric being said and they uh, they it, they feel hurt because of it. Uh, they feel that they are impacted, and so we want to set up a positive role model, set a positive message to them, not give them any kind of negativity like this. Thank you. Um, not only have I faced bullying because I am a Muslim, but I have first I have seen firsthand what it is like to be a Muslim in America. Not only has Donald Trump incited bigotry and racism in our community, but he has also shown that his campaign is based off of and not o based off of racism and uh, based off of the fears of other human beings. His campaign is not only racist, but it in but it incites fear to the people who do not really know what Islam stands for and do not really know what Muslim the Muslim community believes. Donald Trump not only not only does he pry on the fear of poor people who do not know what Islam is and do not have any interaction with Muslims, but he f he crawls on the fear of people who do know who do know Muslims and cause them to be afraid to interact with Muslims. 
Um, that is all I have to say. I thank you very much. Uh, and then last, we have another youth, uh, also activist, uh, Kenyan uh, Young. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming out here and for care for letting me speak today. Um, I would first like to say that um, I totally condemn the language that Donald Trump is using to incite hate against uh, all marginalized groups, immigrants, Muslims, as well as Hispanics. Um, I would like to say that he, this type of language is setting back a lot of the work that not only Muslims, but also blacks have worked very uh, hard to uh, try to get rid of in the past as well as in the future. Um, groups like uh, the Black, Life, Black Lives Matter and BLP, the Black Liberation uh, Project, which include work between immigrant communities, Muslim communities, black communities, as well as uh, other uh, communities within Minnesota. Um, it's rhetoric like this that makes it so that uh, Muslims, as well as other marginalized communities, cannot uh, become part of the United, cannot become fully integrated into the United States or uh, have the dream of being able to work side by side as human beings and citizens within this nation. It, what his rhetoric is forgetting is that mus uh, being Muslim is being part of the United States and that Islam has been a part of the American tradition since its founding. We've been here since the uh, United States was created and we've been here ever since. We have never disappeared, we've always been around. In that his, uh, if he wants to become the leader of this country, he needs to not only condemn the language that he has used, but he needs to disavow anyone around him that has used this language and that thinks that it is okay. We cannot stand for someone to run as president and to be able to look half of the country, most of the country in the face and say horrible, racist, Islamophobic things. Uh, with that, I will now open uh, for questions, if you have any questions. Could you, we'd like to ask the, the young man, yes. the youngest here, um, kid, would you mind telling us how some of these bullying incidents have, have happened and it ha has it gotten worse since Trump has been running for president? Well, once Donald, uh, once there was this kid who, I was just walking down the hall just right after school had ended and this kid said, hey, and I was just walking and I was like, oh, hello, and he said, why do your people attack us for no reason? And that really affected me because I've never been bullied because I was Muslim. And it also felt bad because I didn't know what to do. So I just stood there. And I just walked away because I didn't know what to do. So. I'm sorry you had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. It's all right. So, I mean, I've, I have faced, I have faced a couple bullying incidents, but not as straightforward as that one. So, when he said that, it just really affected me, because I have never done anything wrong to anybody. I mean. I have never done anything to provoke this kid. I was just walking down the hallway. So, I mean, I did tell the principal and he, I think he did something about it because I didn't f face any more, um, I didn't face any more bullying because I was Muslim, but he did affect me a lot. So, yeah. And thankfully my school does allow me to pray at school, so I mean, my school is very inclusive, and it is very, very, very liberal towards um, of towards me praying, so I can go to the office and pray. So I mean, I can pray, and my school is very, is very lenient on that. But it is really sad that people 
have been confused by this man and have been have been pointed in the direction that all Muslims are terrorists, which is really, really sad. Because terror is not, is not meant for one religion. It's, terrorism is the act that you inflict terror on someone. So all people are, are able to commit terror. So the, so the thought that all Muslims are terrorists is, is absolute, is absolute hypocrisy because everybody has committed terror in one way, shape, or form. Because if you have made someone, if you have hurt someone's feelings, then you have inflicted terror. So, I mean, if you say that all Muslims are terrorists, then you are basically a hypocrite. So, especially Donald Trump, he is a main figure of terror in this country because he has caused pain towards lots of people. So if you want to say that all Muslims are terrorists, you must realize what the definition of terrorism is. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Sir, Dungan, how old are you? I'm turning 13 on the 25th. Okay, and what grade are you in? I'm going to eighth grade. Okay, thanks very much. I really appreciate that. I think you saw um, probably the most vulnerable uh, segment of our community that has to deal with um, uh, and has to process a lot of this conversation, this rhetoric, and uh, we are concerned as a community uh, this upcoming school year, in a few weeks when Muslim students return back to school, the type of bullying that they will face. Uh, and uh, this past summer I have had a chance to meet with a lot of young uh, Muslim uh, youth across the state of Minnesota through my outreach, and during, especially during Ramadan, and many of them have shared with me that they are being bullied at school. And uh, now as we head toward probably the most uh, contested or, 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 or to the heat of the upcoming election, it is critical to recognize that these rhetoric do affect uh, uh, our community and they do incite people and incite young people to act against Muslims. Uh, um, and unfortunately that has already been happening but with, the ra with this current rhetoric coming from this campaign, uh, from Trump's campaign, it will increase uh, the, those acts. And so I think this is an evidence as you can see from one incident at least. Jelani, can you talk about the, um, the, the impact of the, uh, after um, Ilhan Omar mm -hmm. was, uh, she gets this uh, endorsement and then maybe a week later there's this news that comes out about questioning her, mm -hmm. uh, her marriage. Mm -hmm. um, what impact does that have on the community and do you think that has something to do with this Trump atmosphere? Well, I think we, we have to recognize that uh, now the anti-Muslim uh, organizing uh, is at a, at a high gear. There are many organizations, many people who are interested uh, in the affairs of Muslims. Uh, and and uh, Ilhan is going to be someone who will come under a tremendous scrutiny because of the fact that she's Muslim. Uh, it was reported recently that the two Muslim uh, uh, politicians, at least the most prominent two Muslim politicians, Abdi Wassami, who's a city council member for the city of Minneapolis, and our congressman, Keith Ellison, have been getting number of hate calls and mails uh, in the past uh, few months and perhaps in the, in the last few years as well. Uh, and that has spiked. So as someone who's a public figure, she will come at tremendous scrutiny. And that scrutiny will be added specifically coming from these uh, groups that are organizing against Muslims, sometimes in the shadows, sometimes in the front. Thank you. Thank you.